Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about the future of paramedicine as we see it from clinical medical programs here at BCHS. Uh, we've got a wonderful team of paramedic practice leaders working with our medical directors and uh, ED boss physicians and others to sort of look at the future of where we're going within uh, terms of pre-hospital care in British Columbia and a little snapshot of what I think is happening across Canada. I have no disclosures uh, to, uh, to talk about. Now, the future is hard to predict, obviously, uh, particularly with changing landscapes, changing politics, as well as the changing professional status of paramedics across the country. But we can look to other countries around the world who have evolved in similar fashion, and in fact, probably prior to or earlier than Canada has, uh, to see where we might end up. What I want to speak about is uh, the BCHS action plan very briefly because you're going to hear from uh, Nick Smith later on today to speak about this much more thoroughly. So I'll talk about the action plan in terms of our focus on clinical and professional practice. Uh, what's called Vision 2025 in Canada, which is a vision nationally that paramedics will have a baccalaureate degree as entry to practice by 2025. Ambitious, but I'll speak more about that. I uh, talk about paramedic clinical leadership, which John Talon, unfortunately, is not here to speak about, but something that he's really pushing forward in terms of paramedics helping to move paramedic practice forward. And uh, something that's happening across the country in five provinces, and not quite in BC yet, but paramedic self-regulation. So, British Columbia Emergency Health Services, formerly BC Ambulance Service, has a really proud tradition uh, since 1974 of being a provincial, um, the one of the largest provincial ambulance services in the country. But we've had a very linear operation. So since 1974, right till now, if you call 911, you get a call taker and a dispatcher who will send an ambulance. Ambulance will respond to your home and usually take you to a hospital. We did this in 1974 and we're doing this today. In fact, we still have policies, procedures, and in fact, a culture of paramedicine that says, every time I see a patient, that patient needs to go to the emergency department. And our culture and our operations hasn't really changed that much in more than 44 years. We have added fire first response and other first responders, which we know have a huge role to play in terms of time-dependent emergency care. Uh, they can provide fibrillation, CPR, stop bleeding, and also give us information about the patient prior to our arrival. Recently, as everybody knows, we've got this opioid overdose crisis that's hit British Columbia as much of uh, the rest of Canada and North America, and first responders have absolutely had a huge role in, in saving lives. So that's an innovation that's happened over this 44-year period. We also have an advanced life support here in British Columbia, and it's a paired and targeted advanced life support concept. It really only exists in six of our largest sort of areas, the Lower Mainland, Victoria, Nanaimo, Kamloops, Kelowna, and Prince George. So unlike other provinces that have much more coverage by advanced life support paramedics, we have high density coverage by advanced life support paramedics, and still the targeted fashion which I think provides super opportunity for our ACPs to provide lots of care in terms of advanced procedures, intubations. They're incredibly skilled ACPs. With a simple comparison, in British Columbia today, we have about 220 full-time ACPs. If you go to Alberta, they have close to 2,000. So big difference in just the number of advanced life support. And then we have, as we're talking about the last couple of days, critical care paramedics. And um, I've had an opportunity to train critical care paramedics at the post-grad level in Australia and New Zealand. I worked as a, a STARS paramedic. And I really do believe that our CCPs are the highest skilled paramedics that I, th I think exist on the planet uh, because they are traveling uh, by themselves, often without physicians, mostly without physicians. And they're providing skills, EEGs, mechanical ventilation, prone ventilation, ultrasound, things that are truly critical care and doing it as paramedics. And then when we look to our in, in transport team, again, kind of a world exclusive where we have paramedics doing neonatal and pediatric high-risk transports, often without physicians, certainly without nurses or, or RTs like most other systems. So we've got very high-skilled paramedics, but we still have this linear system, you call, we call. <coughs> Um, we are starting to get into the area of having some community paramedics that we'll speak a little bit about later and then get more from. The challenge with the you call, we, you call, we call model is that it's not sustainable. Our call volume is increasing by 6 to 7% a year. We can't handle the volume. We can't take every patient to the emergency department anymore. And our ALS resources are stretched. They can't lay it on the calls because we have too many calls. So consequently, the patients are not getting advanced life support when they can use it. And I'm not talking about cardiac arrest because we actually have good cardiac arrest captured by ALS. I'm talking about the things that would matter to me. If I have pain, I can't get good analgesia. If I have a STEMI, I'm not getting a 12 lead ECG. If I have severe shortness of breath, all I'm getting is pretty much basic life support. So we need to, to change things. We're also overcrowding our emergency departments. It's a problem across the country and it's a problem here because again, we're taking every single patient to the emergency department who doesn't need to be there. So we're creating a problem for ourselves. 
We're also, we know as paramedics, we're not providing the best care. When we take the frail, el the frail elderly faller to the emergency department, or the palliative care patient, or the mental health patient, we know as paramedics, we're not providing the best care. And we also know that paramedicine is evolving nationally and internationally, and we're not evolving here. We're still doing what we've always done for 44 years. So we're about 18 months into a three-year action plan that has four objectives, and again, you'll hear more about this uh, later this afternoon. But we want to get to our highest acuity calls faster across the province. So if we've got a sick patient anywhere in the province, we want to get that there faster than we are today. We also want to stabilize our workforce model. We have a fairly old-fashioned workforce model where when you graduate as a primary care paramedic, we send you to the middle of nowhere in British Columbia with really no support, where you work for a number of years for $2 an hour, and then eventually you get to come to Vancouver to get a full-time job, and then spend the rest of your career going back to the community you came from. And uh, it doesn't work. We're not getting the best and the brightest because people are saying, why would I go become a PCP or an ACP? I won't go be a nurse or I'll go to become a respiratory therapist or I'll go to Alberta and work as a paramedic. So we've got to stabilize our workforce strategy to retain staff, to be an employer of choice, and also to provide better care across the province. We also want to deal with our low acuity calls differently. And I think all of you from services across the country will know that our, our low acuity calls are really uh, challenging us. We're, we're not managing them well. But we have great examples around the world where low acuity calls are handled differently. So we need to do that here as well. And we also got to create some capacity in our system. We're one of the, I've worked in a number of, of ambulance services. And as you all know, the concept of uh, any kind of emergency services has half capacity. So when it really hits the fan, you've got that A380 coming in hot, you've got resources. Well, our system doesn't. Our system is very stretched. I could go into dispatch when I was the director of operations and I'd say, hey, how's it going today, guys? Oh, I have 80 calls in the queue. We have no ambulances available. We had no stretch in our system. So our system needs to address a number of these issues. And that's our action plan. And fortunately, the provincial government, government gave us $91 million to address this. So this is the uh, infographic for our action plan. What we want to do is triage differently so that we can deal with low acuity path, you know, low acuity call with callers differently, advance our community paramedicine, but only take patients to hospital if needed. And that's a big cultural, big operational shift. Getting paramedics to think about keeping patients at home, referring to other agencies, looking for other healthcare services is something that we need to get to. Uh, fortunately, the Minister of Health in uh, March 2017 uh, changed our legislation and regulation to allow this to happen. So we're now allowed to hear and treat. So we can put clinicians in our dispatch center, they can talk to, to patients who are calling, treat them over the phone, and we don't send an ambulance. So we're allowed to do that in legislation now. We can see and treat. So we can send paramedics to the scene, treat a patient, and not transport them to the hospital. Prior to this, we weren't allowed to. So that's why we have this culture and operations of taking everybody to the emergency department. And we're also allowed to take patients to alternative destinations. Previously, it had to be a hospital, and that was it, period. We had a few exemptions to go to some clinics and some sobering centers, but we had really little opportunity to take patients to different resource, to different sources. So now we do. Now we have the minister, who uh, it's a fancy badge, who gave us the opportunity to do that. So now we want to look at our call flow differently. When somebody calls 911, we want them to talk to somebody that gets some additional triage. So some of you who went to our dispatch center a couple days ago saw that we have nurses now doing secondary triage. So using the Manchester triage system to look at the calls differently to see if we even need to send an ambulance in the first place. Can we provide self-care instructions? Can we refer them to other agencies? What we want to do is use some of the innovation out of the London Ambulance Service and some of the UK organizations. We put a mental health professional in our dispatch. As anybody who's been in a dispatch center knows, a huge proportion of the calls that come in have a mental health um, component of it. Whether it's somebody who just is lonely and needs somebody to talk to, whether they've got suicidal ideation, or whether they just need referral to another organization or even to a crisis line. So, and, and I've sat in the, in the clinical hub in London and seen how busy the mental health professionals are that deal with those calls and how many calls can actually be diverted away from paramedics. Because as most of us know, paramedics don't really do mental health well. I certainly wasn't trained in, in mental health. Then my answer was either take them to the hospital, give them some ketamine to take them to the hospital, or leave them at home. And that wasn't really the uh, experience that they needed uh, from, from a mental health perspective. We also have added paramedic specialists to our dispatch center. The paramedic specialists are now providing that clinical component of dispatch. They're providing some clinical oversight, some clinical support of our dispatchers and call takers. They're upgrading and downgrading calls. They're, add, they're adding resources or taking resources off of calls. So they're using their experience as advanced care paramedics and critical care paramedics to help make our dispatch call for us better. And when necessary, as most of you in the room who are EPOS uh, know that we always have EPOS to reach out to for that higher level clinical 
decision making, that higher level uh, referral opportunity, so our whole system can now leverage on our emergency physician on-call system. So where we want to go to, and again, you'll hear more about this later, is we want to be able to go to calls and treat people at home or in their workplace and leave them there and not transport them to the hospital. We want to be able to send potentially solo responders, and I've advocated for motorcycles because I think that's super cool. And when I was in Australia and Sydney, they had motorcycles that were awesome. Barbara and Linda Lupini weren't very supportive of that just yet, but I'm still working on it. But I think we can send targeted, highly trained paramedics uh, to calls that can actually treat patients at home or refer them to other organizations. Uh, in Australia, I work for New South Wales Ambulance, and there's a group of paramedics called extended care paramedics, and they, they work with the medical school to get their six months of training, and they can do sutures and zimmer splints and all, antibiotics and, and home blood products, and they can be targeted for calls that we don't ever need to transport those patients to hospital size. I've seen it myself, I think it's brilliant, I think we can do that here. I also think it's not one size fits all. We need to look at our communities across the province and identify the services that exist in those uh, communities, not replicate them, but instead fill the gaps. I think paramedics are really good at finding opportunities to fit into all different sorts of areas. But inevitably, we will have to transport patients, but we don't always have to go to the hospital. Sometimes, yes, we'll need to go to the emergency department. We should save the emergency department for those sick and injured patients that need to be there. But we've got to look at other places to go. Can we go to community care centers, to urgent care centers, which we don't want to get in the, in the habit of transporting patients to urgent care centers because then we become a taxi. But is there a subset of patients that we that can't get there any other way that we're responsible for doing that? Uh, and we, we can probably go to other services as well. Give you a quick anecdote. I know I'm running out of time. Steve's going to give me the hooks shortly. Uh, but I, used, I did some ride alongs in London with London Ambulance Service. So I'm going to with a, a solo responder. He was an advanced care paramedic equivalent. He was an Aussie guy. We went to a lady with shortness of breath. She was a known asthmatic. Uh, he treated her really appropriately. And in London, they don't send a whole ambulance. He was a solo response car. And if they need an ambulance for transport, they call it later. So he treated this woman uh, perfectly. Sent me to make a cup of tea, which she wasn't very happy with because she's British and I made a lousy cup of tea. Uh, but when we came back, when I came back with the tea, he was doing a great detailed history and found out that her cell beauty mall was empty. Uh, her reason for calling today was she prescription was empty. So he bundled her up, put her in a Skoda station wagon, the three of us drove to the pharmacy, he went into the pharmacist, she pulled up the information on the record that said yes, the patient had a prescription, gave the patient a prescription, paramedic gave her a taxi voucher and sent her home. So I'm sitting in the car with him, he's doing his documentation, and I said to him, I said, that was awesome, where's your protocol for that? Where's your clinical practice guideline, your policy, your procedure that had you do that? And he looked at me like I was speaking a different language. He goes, what are you talking about? This is just what we do. She didn't need to go to the emergency department. If I left her at home, my colleagues would have been there tonight again, because she has no medication. So I did what was right, which was taking care of my patient. And I kind of thought for a second, wow, like, this is something that is so simple. It's not easy, but it's something we can all be doing. So we need to look at different opportunities to treat our patients and using our clinicians uh, to do simple things that aren't easy that help our whole system and importantly help patients. But what are we worried about? We're worried about risk. So what that paramedic did took on some risk. That paramedic put his system at risk, put himself at risk, and could potentially put the patient at risk, particularly if his assessment wasn't detailed enough, if he missed something. And we're very risk averse here at BCHS, and I think, and I know, a lot of you across the country who come from other services are also fairly risk averse. None of us want to create risk. But we need to take on some risk to be able to innovate. We need to take on some risk to be able to change. And But we need to do it smartly. We need to get tools. Like I said, we have Manchester Triage System here, a validated tool to help our paramedics and nurses do secondary triage safely. We need to have that on-call support system. We have our EPOS position, those of you in the room here that we can consult with, that maybe you can even talk to the patient. Maybe in the future, you can look through our CF20 tough books, do a video of the patient paramedic experience to help provide some support to, to reduce some of that risk. We need to provide better education and training. Not only at the front end, our paramedics, I think in British Columbia, sadly, and no offense to any paramedics, but we have the lowest level of education in the country. A PCP in BC can do three months of training, 12 ambulance calls, and go work in the middle of nowhere with no support. To me, that's terrifying, particularly when we're asking them to do some incredibly invasive procedures and make very difficult decisions. We need to train them on the front end better to enable them to, to reduce some of our risk. And then while they're here in our organization, we need to provide them better professional development. And we need to provide clinical leadership. And clinical leadership, for those of you in the room, you're thinking, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a given. 
Ambulance services don't have clinical leadership. We have hierarchical systems that are usually based in sort of these paramilitary structures that even good clinicians, when they come to the top and they wear all the gold and they got all the badges, are there really as managers. They are managing processes, they're managing fleet, they're managing equipment, they're ordering toilet paper, they're keeping the stations going, they're managing their dispatch systems. We don't have clinical leaders supporting clinical practice. We need people in ambulance services dedicated to driving professionalism, to driving clinical practice forward, to researching what we're doing. And most systems haven't invested in that. We have medical oversight and medical direction that provide clinical leadership. <coughs> but they're speaking in sometimes different languages. You can be an emergency physician and provide tremendous oversight, and you are here. Our critical care paramedics understand you, they get you. Our advanced care paramedics get you. Our para primary care paramedics, our emergency medical responders, they don't get you. We speak different languages. We need paramedics and other clinicians driving paramedic practice. Uh, we have the luck in our system, and some of you do as well, we have people like Sandra Jennison, and we have Floyd Besserer, and we have Eric Vu, who are paramedics who have become emergency physicians and who are our medical directors. They get us, and that's awesome, and a lot of you get us too. But I think we need to invest in our paramedics uh, to help drive clinical practice. So this is uh, one of our paramedics uh, specialists, his name is Andrew Mills, and uh, previously he, um, we, had, we had a big ice storm one night, and. Uh, our system got clogged, we couldn't get ambulances around, we had all these calls in the queue, and we brought Sandra Jennison, that last picture you saw, into our dispatch center to start calling people, patients who were calling on one and saying, yeah, we're not coming to take care of you, and uh, giving them alternatives. And we also did the same thing with Andrew. Both of them did a good job. And that gave us an idea, well, why don't we just put some paramedics in dispatch to help provide clinical support for our paramedics? And it's, found, it's, it's proving to be incredible. So we've got these paramedic specialists now, in our dispatch center that help oversee dispatch in terms of clinical practice, but they're also answering questions from paramedics across the province. We have 4,100 paramedics in BC. And if you're in Williams Lake or if you're in Zabellis and you are brand new out of school and you've seen CPAC once when you got training at the Justice Institute and now your patient's really sick and you look at this system with all these hoses and you go, I don't know what to do. Prior to now, the really bold ones would have called EPOFs and said, hey Floyd, I've got this CPAP mask, I have no idea how to put it on. Most of them, though, would be too embarrassed to call a doctor and admit they don't know how to use the equipment that are on their ambulances. But they're not as embarrassed to call a trusted colleague, a paramedic, and say, hey, Andrew, I've got a CPAP patient that I think I need to put the device on, but I don't know how to do it. And he goes, hey, no problem, here's what we're going to do. This is happening every single day in our Vancouver Dispatch Center now. We have paramedics calling in for advice on simple things that are simple that they weren't calling about before. So education is important. As I said, entry to practice education needs to change. We need to advance entry to practice for our paramedics across the country. That this is a logo for the Paramedic Association of Canada, and they have a Vision 2025 which says baccalaureate degrees or higher for entry to practice. That's entry to practice. That's not ALS practice, that's PCP practice. It's not much of a stretch for Eastern Canada where PCPs have two year diploma, but in Western Canada, when we have three months and 12 ambulance calls, moving to a baccalaureate degree is a big shift. The paramedic chiefs of Canada have also validated this. The paramedic chiefs are the leaders of the ambulance services across the country who also said, we want baccalaureate degrees entry to practice. Next door in Alberta, starting next month, they're putting on degree or higher preferred for entry to practice. And it's setting that expectation that paramedics with a degree will have a fast track to a job versus those coming through the diploma programs. So that's setting the expectation. It's not saying you have to have a degree, but they're starting to set that practice. In British Columbia, we have a position statement and a briefing note to the minister along those same lines. It's not released yet, so it's kind of a spoiler alert, uh, but we're looking towards the same thing. But it's going to be, it's not going to be 2025, that's ultra too ambitious. If we can get here by 2030, uh, that would be ideal. The, Par the Justice Institute of British Columbia is our training agency, primarily in British Columbia, and they've got a plan to do a two-year PCP diploma, which kind of aligns with Eastern Canada, and then a two-year ACP degree. So in the next few years, we'll see a diploma degree pathway coming to British Columbia. And then from there, we can leverage onto more things to an entry to baccalaureate. The exciting part of having baccalaureate degrees for paramedics is that now we have opportunities for master's degrees. We have opportunities for PhD training. On two hands, you can easily count all the PhD paramedics in the country. In fact, I think on one hand you could. There's a very few of them, we all know who they are. They're very busy trying to be involved in the research project. But if you go to Australia, they're pushing 50 PhD paramedics right now. The UK is probably in the 30 to 40. We are way, way behind, and we can do this. But until we get paramedics at the base level where they actually can move on to those other areas, we're not gonna have that. 
And we're not the only ones. In fact, we're late to the party. New Zealand, Australia, uh, Poland, the, the Ireland, the Czech Republic, South Africa, Finland, and uh, the UK all have entry to practice degrees. So this is not something new for us. We're, we're late to the party. We can just look to what they did, or the problems, or the errors, or the things they did wrong to apply the same concepts here in Canada. Now this is a model that I love. It's simple, but it's, um, it's, it's beautiful. So this is from the College of Paramedics in the UK, and this is uh, their career pathway. And this says that paramedics really, with good advanced education, can have three different career pathways within organizations. They can have a clinical practice pathway. Those people who love clinic, clinical practice, those, want, those people that want to take care of patients can advance from a degree to a, to a grad diploma, to a grad certificate, to a master's degree, to a PhD, and still stay in clinical practice. They can become paramedic specialists, advanced care paramedic practitioners, and become consultant paramedics. If you want to work in management, you can do the same thing. Move up your management ranks. If you want to be in education, you can trade, you know, in-service uh, education within your organization, go to the university and be lecturers, and then ultimately be a professor, and also and along the same channel, the path of research as well. In the center of this is what's called a consultant paramedic. And the consultant paramedic is like a dyad to our medical directors. This is the paramedic that works with the medical director of the system to drive paramedicine forward. They work on clinical practice guidelines, they research together, they work on implementing the medical principles of practice. Uh, they are the pinnacle paramedics driving ambulance services. And that's what I've done here, and John Talon has supported us on doing this with my paramedic practice leaders. So I have three of them. Leon's up front, John Deacon's in the back, and Willie's over here. Three paramedic practice leaders who we are now empowering to work in dyad relationships with our medical directors to help us drive paramedicine forward. These paramedics understand paramedic practice, and from a worldwide context, it can continually look what's happening and try to bring that to British Columbia. Um, we also have paramedic specialists now, and we're, we're going through a pathway to give them a higher education so that we can create this, this flow of paramedic clinical leaders uh, in British Columbia. And again, we've got Blueprints. This is a great book by uh, Amanda Blatter out of uh, the UK who writes about paramedic clinical leadership. So, right at the height of our opioid crisis, we understood that we, we weren't really managing the opioid crisis well. We were struggling to respond, so we hired 12 uh, paramedic specialists. And uh, these are the first 12 that we hired. These were the ones that were going to go in solo response vehicles to support our PCPs, layering on these complex overdoses in downtown Eastside. In British Columbia at our height, we were 135 opioid overdoses per day. So we were struggling to, to manage those opioid overdoses. And they were, most of them were fairly routine, could be handled at the basic life support level. Some of those with aspirations or mixed with crystal meth and other things re required advanced care paramedics. So we put them in single response vehicles. We also put them in dispatch to help manage the system. And when we picked them, we picked them not only because they were experienced clinicians with great education, but they were nice people. They were leaders who people trusted and respected. So we hired the best, the brightest, the nicest, and it's been a really huge success. So now we have the paramedic specialists. As I talked about, we have our paramedic leaders, our paramedic practice leaders, in a dyad relationship with our medical directors, which we've extended to a triad relationship, and it sounds like a gang. Uh, but we've got the, the triads, which we put paramedic practice leader, a medical director, and the director of operations in a triad that they meet at least, at least monthly to solve clinical and uh, professional practice issues. And um, it's, it's working really well, so those are our three guys. So this is starting to fulfill John Talon's vision and, and my personal vision of paramedics leading paramedic practice, mm -hmm. which requires the input of our physicians plus other allied health agencies, nurses, nurse practitioners, mental health professionals, so that we can do these things differently that are gonna change the culture and the operations of the organization. Now, I talked about the need for self-governance and, and the need for paramedic sort of representation. So British Columbia is actually I think quite, quite uh, behind, and I'm sensitive that Phil Yoon, who's our, our board uh, from the EMALB, is in the room, but I think that in British Columbia, we have 26 recognized health professionals, or 26 regulated health professionals. Professions. 25 of those are in the Health Professions Act as self-regulated professions. And one, which is paramedicine, is stuck off that group. So we are separated under the EMALB, Emergency Medical Assistance Licensing Board. And um, it's, it's regulation, which is great. It ensures that parents have licenses, which is great. It ensures that parents do continuing education, which is great. But it's not self-regulation. It's different than self-regulation. If you look at uh, Australia, in December 2018, they became nationally regulated under the health profession, uh, the health profession. so APRA regulates paramedics. In the UK, they're regulated. Five provinces of Canada have self-regulation, and some of us don't. Ontario doesn't, uh, BC doesn't, uh, but Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, and uh, 
Nova Scotia do. So we need to get down to the pathway of professionalization. Not because this is going to help paramedics get rich or become very high profile, it's because we need to hold paramedics accountable. Paramedics need to be held, held accountable to the public, paramedics need to be held accountable to their practice, paramedics need to be accountable for their professional development, and that's not happening right now. We are stagnant in terms of our professional evolution because we're not holding ourselves accountable. We're government regulated, and unfortunately government sometimes doesn't do a very good job of driving innovation or holding people accountable for the future. So my personal opinion is self-regulation leads us to more accountability, more transparency, and ultimately better care. So as I said, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia have paramedic self-regulation. It's fairly new in many of those provinces, still evolving, and I think over the next decade, we'll start to see this have some substantial improvement and opportunities. So in BC, we have this really strong union that governs the BC ambulance paramedics. BC paramedics uh, are, are well represented by a really strong union. We only recently have an association. Up until now, we have had a few starts and stops with an association, but now we have the, the BC um, Paramedic Association that's trying to become organized to represent practice in British Columbia and it's led by some of our exceptional critical care paramedics, advanced care paramedics, and primary care paramedics. And we have the licensing board that governs us, but we don't have yet a college in British Columbia. One of our challenges in, in BC is that the BC Emergency Health Services Act gives us as a corporation responsibility for all pre-hospital care in the province. And that's cool. That allows us to be very innovative, allows us to grow, allows us to evolve. The problem is we really only have responsibility for 4,100 employees, but we have 15,000 licensed emergency medical assistants. We have 15,000 people that are licensed to provide pre-hospital care, and they range from first responder, kind of advanced first aid, and I don't mean to be derogatory, but that's what first responder sort of is, right up to our critical care paramedics who have adult specializations and infant transport team specialization, the, 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 you know, super complex care, and everything in between. And we know that our system has good medical oversight. We have good EPOS support. We have paramedic specialists supporting them. We have paramedic practice leaders supporting them. That's only 4,100 of these 15,000. What's happening to the other 10,000 plus licensed people doing pre-hospital care in the province? We don't really know. We don't really know what their quality of documentation is, what their research is doing, what their medical oversight models look like, even what they're doing in practice. Uh, we find out sometimes by accident when a fire department shows up with a Lucas machine or a ski that shows up with methoxyfluorine. Uh, this pre-hospital care is being provided, even though we are licensed or we are legislated to oversee it, we really don't. And we have some improvements to do to make sure that pre-hospital care in British Columbia continues to evolve. So the future of paramedicine is changing. We're in the midpoint of an action plan that I think will have some substantial opportunities for improvement. Paramedicine is changing, professional evolution is changing, and I think that physician oversight will change too, to become something that's more partnering, so more something more collaborative and, and uh, something that we'll maybe talk about next year. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today.